I'm fired up and excited. Thank you so much for, for being here this morning on a Saturday morning. Uh, we have an excellent crowd here. Really appreciate this. I uh, hope and pray that uh, you will be encouraged, and uh, I know that I will be encouraged uh, being here as well. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get started today, and as you see on the slide, we're talking about uh, living uh, intentionally, and so we're going to have a good study here, and I'd like to get some interaction from everyone as we get started here. Uh, first thing I want to do, I want to go around the room, and I'm going to get started first, but I want to just ask everyone to share one thing, it could be a person or a thing, whatever it may be, uh, that you are thankful for. And we're just going to go around the room here real quickly. Uh, there was a, I had a phone call with my wife yesterday, she went to the dentist, and uh, she's got to get a little bit of work done next week, but uh, I, I'm really thankful for our dental insurance. It is a tremendous blessing, and uh, I'm thankful that she's going to be able to get the, uh, the help that she needs uh, with the dental work. So that's one thing I'm thinking about right now. I'm thankful that I have this opportunity to be here and to study the Word of God. And so let's just go around the room. We'll start with you, brother. We're just going to work on this side and work our way around. What are you thankful for this morning? Awesome. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Yes, your wife. Yeah. What about you, brother? Your family. Good. Let's start up here. Family? Family? Good. Your wife? All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so family and specifically what, what people are doing in our family is awesome. Yeah. Amen, amen. What about you, brother? Yeah, yeah, family, country, absolutely. What about you, brother? Hope? Amen, amen. What about you, brother? Jesus, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, remembering fr friendships. What about you, brother? Good, good. What are you thankful for, brother? In the, all the way in the back. Yeah. We got some good wives. That's a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> we need them. What about you, brother? Yeah, family, friends, support group. What about you? Oh, good. So family, twins coming up. Good. <laughs> Very good. What about you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. What about you, brother? What are you thankful for this morning? Godly parents. Yeah. Parents are a blessing. Uh, my dad was not around when I was growing up, but uh, thankful for my mom and, and grandmother who uh, gave me a lot of whoopings back in the day, but uh, I think they paid off. Brandon, what about you? Yeah. 
Absolutely. What about you, Bastard? Awesome. Very cool. Was that like competitive frisbee or just like fun? Ah, okay, just fun. <laughs> what about you? Your church? Very nice. You're at Kleinwood, right? Is that where you attend? Kleinwood? Yeah? Okay, good. What about you? Waking up this morning? Yeah, absolutely. Every day we wake up. That's a blessing. What about you, young man? Your mom? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you? Yeah. Family, wife. What about you, brother? Family, church, yeah, salvation, that's huge, absolutely. Yeah, Chris, what about you? Wife and kids. Yeah, we're all extremely blessed here, and I appreciate you guys doing that. I will say one more thing. I'm, I'm thankful that the, uh, the Rangers beat the Astros, and uh, I had to get that in. I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out, trying to figure out a way to get that in there, but I uh, got Osteen looking at me, and oh, I got one guy leaving right now, so... I'm off to a bad start this morning, but uh, I could not resist. I still love you guys, though, all right? And we're brothers, so you still have to put up with me. You know, it, it requires us being intentional to be thankful, doesn't it? Uh, it can be very easy to go into the default mode of all the things that are going wrong. And as you think about this idea of what we're going to be talking about, living intentionally, it's more than just, you know, checking things off a list of things we got to do each day. Uh, so much of this is going to be our, our mindset. So I want to begin with a story. It's about a month ago. There's a, a store in Frisco. It's called Shields, S-C-H-E-E-L-S. It's amazing. Anybody been there? Uh, it's unbelievable. It's like a combination of Bucky's and Chick-fil-A, but just like for sports. It's like a destination, like anything you want with sports, athletics, uh, ath athletic gear, whatever. It's just a massive store, and it's just really cool. I'd recommend you go there. I was getting some new shoes for my son Joshua and struck up a conversation with a guy who was uh, working in the shoe department. And a young man, probably in his early 20s or so, and uh, well built. I could tell he was working out and things like that. And somehow we just started talking about college and things like that. And I went to the University of Illinois and he went to University of Iowa. And uh, we talked a little bit, I think, about the Big Ten. But he said something to me that really caught my attention. As we were talking, he graduated, and I can't remember exactly what his major degree was in, um, but when we were talking, he said, essentially, I don't know how I ended up here. I don't know how I ended up here. Um, it's not that he doesn't like his job. I actually went online, and the company is a really nice company. It looks like they're doing some great things for their employees, and cer certainly nothing wrong with retail business and things like that. But the way that he said it, and I wish I would have explored that thought a little bit more, because he had, I think, some expectations. You know, I went to school, I graduated, and so now I have this expectation of, well, this is the direction I should be going in. And yet, when he said that, it just caught my attention because um, he didn't necessarily seem happy where, where he was currently and where I think maybe he was thinking he would be. And I'm saying all this because sometimes life is like that, isn't it? where we may find ourselves asking or thinking to ourselves, essentially, how did I, how did I end up here? Um, I don't know if you've ever thought like that before. And I'm not just talking about ending up here today, but there's a lot of things in life that can cause us to maybe start thinking this way. And I want to share a couple of examples of this. Maybe you have thought this when you, when you stepped on the scale. So at the beginning of the year, and you stepped on that scale, and you realized, wait a second, uh, I, I gained some weight over the holiday season. At the end of 2022, uh, I had gained 17 pounds. I remember January 8, 2023, I stepped on the scale because it was a Sunday morning. And I was putting on a suit, and and the pants wouldn't but the, the the button wouldn't fit. I was like, well, what's going on here? So I finally got on the scale, and I was like, how did I end up here? 17 pounds heavier. But things like that can happen where you don't really notice things, or maybe you do but you're not really doing anything about it. I have been there before. Maybe you've been there as well. Maybe you have thought this when it comes to your career. How did I end up here? I've been working this job for five or 10 years, and 
I know I'm not happy with it. I know I think I could be doing something else, and we're just unsatisfied. But we kind of just keep going through the motion. How, do I, how did I end up here? Maybe you've had this thought before when you think about your marriage. And you've been married for 15, 20, 30 years, 35 years. You know there's been some cracks in the marriage. You know the marriage is maybe on the rocks. And, and you have that conversation with your spouse. And it's not a good conversation. I know all the men in here love their wives because so many of you talked about how thankful you are for your wife. And yet, sometimes we can ask ourselves, how did we get to this situation or to this moment in our marriage? You ever thought this? How did it end up here after you committed a sin that maybe you thought you would never do? A lot of us have probably gone down this path at some point in time. No, I'd I'd never do that. I'd never look at that, I'd never say that, I'd I'd never go there, um, never steal or cheat or whatever the case may be. But then we find ourselves in that very situation. How did I end up here? Maybe you thought this when you look at your retirement funds and you think to yourself, I've made some poor decisions along the way. I have not been wise with the finances and the money that God has blessed me with. How did I end up here? Men have these kinds of moments, and for some it could be, think about Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrew writers warning those Christians, it's possible to drift away. And we know that we have drifted away from the Lord. Maybe we're just going through the motions. We're not zealous for God. We're in a state of apathy. And we end up in a place like that. How did I end up here? You know, I think King David, I don't know for sure, obviously, but maybe he thought something like this, right? When Nathan was talking to him, and I like this idea of a man-to-man, because we all need a Nathan. I don't know if you guys have a Nathan in your life, but a a brother in your life that you can talk to, that you can maybe confide in, and someone who's going to call you out as well, when they know, no, you're not in the place where you need to be. You know, when Nathan told David, you are the man, Maybe some of this registered for David. Man, how did I get here? God has blessed me so much and has given me the kingdom and delivered me from the hands of King Saul and has prospered me and all these things. How did I end up here? Now the sword is not going to depart from my house. I'm 45 years old. I'm going to be 46, Lord willing, in August. And uh, I've been preaching full-time now for the past 15 years. Um, I'll be at West Main six years, Lord willing, March 1st uh, of this year. And I'm thankful, not bragging, but I'm thankful that I have done some things in my life where I have been intentional. Uh, I went to the preacher training program in 2009 at Dallin Road, and that was something intentional. And it really opened up a, a lot of doors and a lot of blessings as well. And yet, I can look in the mirror as well. And this is one of the hardest things for us to do as men. And that's to look in the mirror and say, you know what, there have been some other areas of my life at times, I just have not been as intentional as I should be. Uh, I've mentioned that already with respect to weight or being hypocritical sometimes, you know, with choices or decisions I've made and, and things like that. There's still room for improvement in my marriage, and, and sometimes it can be very easy just to find yourself in a situation where you're just not as intentional as you should be. Well, this isn't going to be a woe is me, doom and gloom kind of discussion this morning. There's good news, and I want to encourage all of us that there is hope. No matter where you may find yourself, we're alive. One of the young men said, waking up, that's what he's thankful for. I'm thankful for that as well. The fact that we woke up, that is a blessing, and we have another opportunity to do the right thing. And that means that our lives can improve and change for the better. And change can come fast. But we also have to understand that when we think about success, whether it's with um, finances or our marriage and even the direction we're going with our faith, it doesn't happen by accident. You would agree with that, right? Things just don't happen by accident. We have to live a life where we are intentional in nature. So when you think about this idea of what intentional means, you guys give me a couple of definitions. You can write it in on there on point number one if you like or listen, but What comes to mind when you hear the word intentional? What comes to mind when you hear the word intentional? Yeah. Deliberate. Yeah, deliberate. Who else had a thought? Yeah. 
I like that. Deliberate, forethought, purpose. Any other words that come to mind or definition? Planning. Yeah, of course. Uh, deliberate, forethought, planning, having a course. That's exactly right. And when we think about living uh, intentionally, all of those things come to mind. There has to be intention or purpose and deliberate action. It's not just this idea of just kind of, you know, going through the motion, so to speak. So what's the opposite of being intentional outside of the word unintentional? What other words come to mind when you think about being uh, the opposite of being intentional? Let things happen to you. Yeah, the idea of maybe being passive, right? You think about social media, it's kind of a passive exercise. We look at other people's lives and we just kind of scroll and there's an algorithm. We don't have any control of that algorithm. Whatever it gives us, that's what we take. Um, yeah, we let other things happen to us. What else? Aimlessly. Excellent. Yeah, there, we're just kind of walking around aimlessly. No direction at all. Sometimes young people can struggle with this, but even um, grown men, we can struggle with this as well. What else? Carefree. Yeah, carefree. Don't really doesn't really matter what happens, right? Just carefree. Let's just see where, where the wind blows. Yeah. Random. Yeah, that's a great word. Random. That's exactly right, right? Um, the, I like the, yeah, passive. You guys mentioned that. Haphazard. A, a lack of order or a lack of planning. Irregularity by randomness. Determined by or dependent on chance. Aimless. That's exactly right. And so what sounds better to you? Well, it depends. It depends on maybe what kind of mood we're in, right? When life gets hard, well, let's just see how things go. And let's just, hopefully things will go for the best. Sometimes we can have that attitude. But that's not going to be a, a successful attitude, especially when it comes to our, um, to our faith. Uh, Dave Ramsey, he talks about this with respect to financial success. We know that financial success doesn't happen by accident. And he had a study and... Um, it said that most millionaires in America did not receive a financial inheritance. Instead, they were intentional with their money. Intentional with their money, right? There, there was some kind of plan. There were some steps that they took. There's a man that I learned of. His name was John Goddard. And I just want to read this here to you. Uh, he lived a number of years ago. But it says, one rainy afternoon, an inspired 15-year-old boy named John Goddard sat down at his kitchen table in Los Angeles and wrote three words at the top of a yellow pad. My life list. And under that heading, he wrote down 127 goals. Now that is impressive. 127 for a 15-year-old. And at the time of this writing, which was a number of years ago, he had accomplished 109 of them. And people would refer to him like the modern-day Indiana Jones, right? So it wasn't just like, doing some things that we may think as a, uh, you know, some kind of a normal type goal. No, he's climbing mountains. He's going on uh, different uh, adventures on the world's longest rivers, piloting the world's fastest aircraft, running a mile in five minutes. Uh, I wish I could run a mile in five minutes. The fastest, I think, was like 6.05 in high school. Never could get lower than that. Reading the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. That's living an intentional life. That's really impressive. Writing down at age 15, 127 goals, and then having the purpose and the focus to get that done. Now, those things are great. There's money and adventure, but almost every one of us in here said something about family and faith. And we know those are most important, don't we? Our faith and our family. And being intentional with faith and with our family. So I want to talk about that a little bit here. I mentioned King David, and I want to hear from you. Can you think of anyone else in the Bible, uh, or maybe events in Scripture, where people may have thought to themselves, how did we end up here? David may have thought that way when he uh, was having that conversation with Nathan. Can you think of any other examples in the old or new, where somebody's like, how did I end up here? Go ahead. Job, yeah, and that wasn't anything sinful on his part, right? But yeah, how did I end up here? I wish I was never born. That's what he said in chapter 3 and verse 1. That's a great example. Job, what's another example? Judas. Yeah, Judas, right? Is that what you said, Judas? 
Oh, you said Judas. I'm sorry. Yeah, Judas. So think about Judas when he gets his 30 pieces of silver. So Job, Judas, what did you say, brother? Ah, yeah. Naomi, Ruth, that's exactly right. Life situations. Yeah, what else? That's exactly right. Think about the book of Judges or Assyria, uh, Babylonian captivity. You got your hand up, Chris? Cain. That's a, that's a great example. Uh, Genesis chapter 4. What's interesting about that, too, Cain, had a, Cain was warned by God. Um, you know, sin is crouching at the door, um, and its desire is for you. So Cain was warned. In fact, Israel was warned, right? And yet they still ended up there. Do you have your hand up, brother? Yeah, Esther, yeah, yeah, the, the situation where she was able to help deliver her people. Who else? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Moses, that's exactly right, right, being on the run and now leading a nation. Jonah, that's a great example. I like that one, too, yeah. Saul of Tarsus, absolutely, all right, being blind for three days and three nights. What else? Who else? hiding in a cave next to the juniper tree, uh, praying that he will die. And uh, isn't that interesting, though? That's how life can be sometimes, right? We can have these mountaintop experiences, and then in the next moment, we're in the valley of the shadow of death. And all of those examples are, are excellent. Any other examples? Who? Saul. King Saul? Yeah. One decision. Right? Wait seven days for the prophet to, uh, to come up. And uh, that's right. That's right. That's a great example. So there's a lot of examples of individuals who did not live intentionally. And there's great reason for us to study those stories and to think about, you know, when we're living intentionally, there is a direction. There's a path. And, you know, we can get by maybe a little bit kind of doing things by accident, but you know, what you mentioned, uh, Don, about YouTube and being able to fix things, that's not going to work, right? If you're just kind of, hey, let's see how this works out here, right? There has to be some kind of direction and purpose. And as men of God, as we think about man to man, uh, that's, what, that's what we're called to do. And we know the results when that does not happen. And so I want to look at Jesus here for a few minutes. Your, um, uh, your theme this year, and we've already answered that question, is... Um, Mind your king, is that correct? Mind your king, right? And so think about Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount with how intentional he wants his kingdom citizens to be. Seek first what? Yeah, God's righteousness, the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. When you pray, right? When you fast, uh, you know, how we judge, all these things here. Jesus expects us to be uh, intentional. And he practiced, obviously, what he uh, is teaching us as well. Look over in Mark chapter 1. I want you just to notice uh, different areas of his life with how Jesus was uh, intentional. Actually, start over in Mark chapter 10. You think about his whole purpose here in Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45. Mark 10 and verse number 45, uh, the Bible says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the very reason why he came to earth was intentional, right? The predetermined plan of God. Uh, in Acts chapter 2 that Peter talked about as well. You remember in Mark chapter 1, Jesus was intentional with his time alone with God. A number of years ago, a sister in Christ told me about this, I guess, acronym TAG, time alone with God. In Mark chapter 1, notice what Jesus did, how he planned his days. It says, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. So that doesn't happen by accident either. This is something that he's doing. The crowds are after him. The crowds want his attention. In fact, the disciples are looking for him while he is there praying and saying, listen, everybody is looking for you. But that was priority for him, time alone with God. Look over in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, and look at verse number 15 and verse number 16. Jesus, he lived an intentional life. Yes, he came to do the will of God, and he understood what would be required. He would have to stay connected to his Father 
in heaven. And this is a great pattern for us with how we prioritize our days and our lives as well. Luke 5, verse 15, But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. That doesn't happen by accident. That's intentional. Where, you know, people love crowds. People want to be surrounded by so many other people. But he's got to be really focused and intentional and say, no, this is priority. I'm going to spend time with my Father in heaven in prayer. Look over in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, Jesus, as he prayed for his, well, for himself and for the disciples and then for the world, in John chapter 17, in verse number 4, he says, in John 17, in verse number 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. He had a work. He accomplished the work that his father had given him to do. The only way you do that is by being intentional. Uh, There's another verse I want to add here that's not on the slide. Look over in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, in verse number 51. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 51 we see how intent Jesus was. Uh, Nothing was going to get in his way with accomplishing God's work. Luke 9 and verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. His face was set. He was determined. He knew where he was headed. There's a um, a lot of different ways and places he went as we get further and further in the Gospel of Luke, but he made his way to Jerusalem, where he would eventually die on the cross. And in John chapter 19, we know those last three words that he said. It is finished. He accomplished God's work. It wasn't by accident. There was priorities. There was focus. There was intentionality. There was something bigger at stake. It was us in accomplishing God's work. He's not the only one when you look in the New Testament. Look over in Acts chapter 6. His apostles learned from him as well. I I think this is just a great example of, you know, understanding first things first. Uh, Keep the first thing, the main thing. A A lot of people say it in a lot of different ways. Put your attention on your intention. In Acts chapter 6, verse number 1, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked and the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. They weren't being mean. They said, no, 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 this isn't what we need to be doing. We can't neglect the word of God. And think about that. Is that our mindset, right? Whether it's neglecting God's word or neglecting time in prayer. They weren't being mean with respect to these widows. They said, no, no, we have to say focus on the word of God. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. You see how intentional they really were? This is the main thing for us. Not saying that these widows are not important, but we're not going to serve tables. This is where our focus has to be. I love that example there because they could have easily just said, no, 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 we'll take care of this. And and then the, the bigger things would get pushed to the side. But they didn't do that. And that's a great example for us. Let me give you one more, then I want to hear from you. In Ezra chapter 7, look over in Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Uh, This is just a great pattern for us as we think about uh, our faith and walking with the Lord, um, studying the Word of God, what we're doing in our lives. Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10. For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. He set his heart. He determined. He was intentional. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to get done. This was focusing on 
spiritual matters, putting first things first. There are a lot of examples in the Word of God. Look over in Colossians chapter 3 about this mindset we're supposed to have of how intentional really we should be. Our lives should not be tossed to and fro and just kind of kind of wandering around and things happening you know, by accident. You look over in Colossians chapter 3, uh, Paul, as he's writing to these Christians, warning them about the different philosophies of the world, he's also encouraging them, here's what you need to do. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set, in my margin it says, or be intent on, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Set your mind on things above. That is something we have to be willing to do. And we have to say, no, this is who I am and this is what I'm going to do. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Our minds are really, that's where the battle really is. There is a battle for our attention. We all have it, most likely. It's called a cell phone, right? (laughs) It's a screen or a Nintendo Switch, or an iPad, or work, or whatever the case may be. But Paul is saying, no, you set your mind on things above. Look over in Philippians chapter 4. We see this attitude as well by Paul in Philippians chapter 4. And I I love Paul. We talked about being thankful at the beginning. Think about Paul and how he was content. Um, He's writing this from prison. And yet Paul is content. And yet Paul is still full of joy. In Philippians 4 and verse... Number six, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says here in verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, If there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. You see the focus? Ponder. Be deliberate about where we put our mind and our attention as well. This changes everything. If we are going to live intentionally and be the men that we desire to be, men of God, men of faith, Uh, Be the husbands we desire to be. We all have fantastic wives. And and helping them to grow in their faith. And helping our young people, helping our children. What other individuals in the New Testament come to mind when you think about those, or maybe in the Old Testament as well, who lived intentional lives for God? I gave you a few examples. Who else comes to mind when you think about uh, those who lived intentional lives? Say it again. Joshua, yes, dare to stand like Joshua. That's exactly right. Joshua, uh, yeah, Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous. Who else? Oh, Dorcas, yeah. Acts chapter 9, making um, clothing for the widows. Good. Acts chapter 9, Dorcas, who else? I like that one. Enoch. He walked with God. Absolutely, yeah. Genesis chapter 5. And he walked with God a long time, didn't he? (laughs) 365 years, and then he was taken up. He walked with God. That requires us being intentional. Who else? Is that it? Go ahead, brother. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. That's a great example with Matthew. Being intentional doesn't mean it's just necessarily going to be easy, does it? Uh, There's going to be some sacrifices. Anyone else? Anyone else in the New Testament you can think about? New world. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely, yeah. Paul, uh, before he was converted, and then afterwards. That's a great example. Acts chapter 9 may be a great template, right, where he is zealous, and he's converted, and yet he still remains zealous now for the, for the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. First Corinthians chapter nine, uh, verses uh, twenty six and twenty seven. How he ran, I discipline my body, and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. That's excellent. What? Oh, go ahead, Osteen. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> That is a great example. I like referring to uh, Priscilla and Aquila as a power couple, right, with how they work together. And sometimes that's a hard thing. Remember when COVID, you know, a lot of couples had a lot more time together, and then some of those couples may not still be together. Uh, but there's something about, for us as Christians, working with our spouses, praying with our spouses. Um, and then uh, Ananias and Sapphira, the exact opposite, but, opposite, but their intentions were, were sinful intentions. Great example. So something good for us to think about in our marriages, too. Yeah. Any other thoughts? These are really good. I need to make sure I capture all of these. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the widow who gave her last uh, two mites. That's a great example. Uh, that's very intentional. Absolutely. So what makes in, living intentional hard? If you were to think about this a little bit, all of us were hopefully intent on coming here this morning. You made it here. We got here on time. We got dressed. We had breakfast, things like that. Why is it sometimes that living intentionally is hard? We know that it's important. We know that there are plenty of biblical examples. What's one of the challenges with this idea of living intentionally? How might you answer that? Society, distractions, dive into that a little bit more. Tell me more. Raise your hand if you can relate to that. You want to relate to that? All of us. It's a challenge for all of us, right? Yeah. So societal, society and pressures um, split. That's a good way of looking at it, right? Kind of, you know, which way am I supposed to be going? Who else had a, a thought? Why is it difficult? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. What might be some other giants that we have to face as men? Let's talk about that real quickly. That that sometimes get in the way. What do you, what do you think about that? What are some giants? Yeah. So think about that, and then I'll come to you next. Um, have we done that before? Uh, you don't have to show, raise a hand, or raise your hand, but 
how intentional have we been with, well, I know in Ephesians chapter 5 that the devil is going to be shooting fiery arrows at me and at my shield of faith. Have we taken the time individually to really think about what might some of those arrows be? There's something there about really living intentionally with our own personal walk and understanding how the devil, what tools seem to be more effective for us individually, and then what and then what can we do about that? I think that's a great, that's something really good for us to think about. Where Where is our stumbling block? It's not for, all of us are different, right? And there's going to be different temptations that will impact us more than others. And so there's a point of application right now for you to do, if you want to write that down. Think about what arrows, and, and look back in your life. Look back in your life. Look back the past week, past month, past year. Look at your marriage. Where have those arrows come from? What do they look like? There's probably a pattern. There's probably a pattern. Maybe there's worry. Maybe there's uh, lust of the heart. Maybe there's uh, anger. Maybe there's uh, pornography. Maybe there's uh, overworking. Uh, there's a lot of different things. Maybe we're not a good steward with some things that God has given us. Um, so that's a great point. What arrows is the devil specifically shooting at me? What about you, brother? What are you going to say? What makes it hard? Ah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, right? Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the path of the ungodly, walking, sitting, standing. Who we surround ourselves with, it makes all the difference. We don't often think about that. I know we talk to young people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, was it? Verse 33, uh, bad company corrupts good morals. He's talking to a bunch of adults in that church. And there were some who were saying, there is no resurrection of the dead. And there was a man committing adultery in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So yeah, who are we surrounding ourselves with? Who's, who's in our inner circle, right? Who's, who's closest to us? That could be potentially a stumbling block with how intentional we can be. Not that we don't want to be, but things that could get in the way. Good, so uh, who we surround ourselves with identifying my own stumbling blocks, my own personal challenges, make it personal. Uh, what else can get in the way of us living intentional lives? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So pride is, that's, that's so great. I was reading the uh, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis last year, and it's so subtle. It's so subtle where we can look at what you were saying there, certain areas of our lives, start maybe even comparing ourselves to other men. I'd say, I don't do that. And I am successful with work, and I am successful here, while we're totally missing, well, no, no, we're not living intentional there. And that hurts and because it forces us to look at reality right? Uh, sometimes the mirror, you know, like when you brush your teeth and the water splatters and things like that, and you don't clean it for a couple of days, it doesn't really look that good, does it? Well, it's hard sometimes looking in the mirror uh, and seeing our own selves. What else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. I can't hide it. That's exactly right. Mindset. Are we optimistic or pessimistic? And I'm not saying that we don't look at bad things that are happening in our lives. And we're going to see an example of that in a moment. But our victory is found in our faith in Christ, right? First John chapter 5. So that's a great point too, right? I can't do this. Well, you know what? On our own, we can't. But we're not on our own, are we? That's the part of the problem. Maybe we're trying to do things all by ourselves, and that's where pride comes back in. Let me figure it out. I was talking to a brother uh, a couple of days ago struggling with uh, drinking and alcohol and um, just a lot of uh, struggles with drugs and things like that. I, I shared my story with him. I drank in college and went to the frat parties and drank primarily to you know for girls and things like that. And my dad was an alcoholic, and that played a big part of me saying, I, I got to make a decision here. What am I going to do? 
And, um, and thankfully, I've been able to, to leave that behind. But yeah, you can have that mindset. How can I do this? And he said, I feel like I have to do this all by myself, all alone. It's hard for us, I know, as guys to open up, but I think a lot of guys feel that way. And my dad was not around. My mom and my sister were in the house. So it was the three musketeers. Who's the only man in the house? Me. So now we, we add this pressure. I, I got to do this all by myself. We will have that I can't do it because on our own, we often can't do it. But with God, he can give us the strength with the right circles around us. All right, we can have that strength. Any other thoughts with what makes this challenge? Yeah, go ahead. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. I forgot to mention that section. That's, that's half the verse. Do not be deceived. That's exactly right. Do not be deceived. And so, yeah, we can, um, I think about 1 John 2, right, where John talks about how we can deceive ourselves. We can deceive ourselves, and that can get in the way of living intentional lives. So we're going to dive into a particular study. I want to share this quote here. Uh, Don, do you want to take a break here in a minute for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll come back, and then we'll wrap it up? I think that will actually work out perfectly. I really appreciate everyone's thoughts. Uh, let me use this new clicker that Chris was telling me about. Let me see if I can get it right. Oh, yeah. Well, that's too big now. Okay. Uh, everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. That's a quote. I have a, it's called a full focus planner that I use, that's my calendar, and uh, there's quotes by people at the top of each day, and uh, as I was prepping for this, I saw that quote, and I was like, that's really good. Everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. Think about our ultimate destination, guys. What is our ultimate destination? What is our ultimate goal? Heaven. Are we just gonna get there by accident? You gotta hear the gospel? We gotta obey the gospel. We gotta be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain, relying upon God's grace and his strength. We have brothers and sisters to help us along the way, confessing sin, turning away from sin. It's just not gonna happen by accident. And so even thinking about our ultimate destination, we are headed somewhere. And if we're going to get there, then it requires us that we be intentional. So when we come back, we're going to study a man by the name of Nehemiah. And he's going to give us a good template of how to live intentionally. And it, it will affect, I think, every aspect of our lives. Our faith, our marriages, our children, whatever it may be that we need to work on more or improve. Um, so we'll take, what, about five minutes? We're going to take five minutes. Let's take a five-minute break. We'll come back right here at 11. Thank you so much for your participation. Excellent thoughts. I praise you with all of-